let's begin the webinar right now. I would like to, uh, first of all, welcome uh, old friends of mine from Latin America that I know are online, uh, new friends from Turkey, and old friends uh, in the United States, and of course, all people that I haven't met yet. The topics I want to talk about in this are, I would like to have a short introduction and I want to talk about the people part of supply and uh, sales and optimis, uh, operations planning process and the socio-technical process. And I want to talk about improving the people part of the SNOP process. This webinar is not really about introducing SNOP or SIOP. It's not about the process of SNOP or integrating and using your ERP to facilitate, enhance, and keep track of all the data and decisions of your SNOP process. We assume that most of the people that are on the call are already familiar with SNOP. We also assume that you understand the basic mechanics, steps, and the process of sales and operations planning. That being said, I'm still going to go backwards just a little bit and tell you from our perspective what the goals of SNOP are or should be. To us, it's about the proactive balancing of demand and supply. It's From the demand side, it's trying to get to one number. So you don't have a finance number, you don't have a, a marketing number, a sales number, and a supply chain number. All those numbers should feed into one. And SNOP enhances a company to be collaborative across various functions and come up with one agreed upon demand plan. The reason you want one demand plan is because you want to have the right products in the right places in the right quantities at the right time. And why do we want to do that? We want to do that to maximize sales. We want to do that to maximize service, and we want to do that to minimize inventory. Oh yes, and I forgot. We also are, use SNOP to manage the efficient and effective and strategic balance of our capacity and our capacity planning. You would like to know what the demand is short term, six months, one year, maybe even further out if you have reliable information, and look at your capacity and decide how to use it more effectively. Decide when you might need to expand your capacity and provide a basis uh, for your case as you take it to your budget meetings. When we talk about the supply chain, this is the model that we use. I've used for a long time and we use in Cadent Resources. We have two parts of it, kind of a demand part of the supply chain. It's the order taking and fulfillment part where we get orders from our customers, we process the orders, uh, the order is then released to a warehouse uh, and assembled and distributed back to the customer. We have a manufacturing or supply part of the supply chain in which goods are replenished to the warehouse. And this is done from some sort of planning activity, manufacturing planning or planning with third party suppliers that may be anywhere in the world. And that's communicated to our or their purchasing base who then releases orders to suppliers who release it to wherever the manufacturing or assembly is being done, and then the inventory is allocated to perhaps our one warehouse or a network of warehouses across the country or across the world. This, we have an information flow that goes from right to left and a material or product flow that goes from left to right. This is all tethered by something we call forecasting or demand planning, which is a primary focus of the first steps of an SNOP process. SNOP helps solve this big multi-criteria supply chain problem. For those of you that have heard our, our webinars on supply chain physics or read our blog pieces on supply chain physics, we look at the supply chain world as a huge multi-criteria problem. It's, it's so complicated that we actually cannot really develop the equations for them, but we can look at it this way. We want to optimize cost, inventory, service, and quality, and we're trying to balance all of those off. We're trying to do that subject to a litany of constraints, 
from manufacturing lead times, transit times, production rates, production capacities, warehouse utilization, transportation equipment availability, and demand volatility. We're doing this over a wide number of SKUs. We're doing it over a smaller number of plants or suppliers and DCs. So we want to have the right products in the right place at the right time. And that truly is a goal of, of the SNOP process. And we also look at it as probably providing the basis for a heuristic solution to this multi-criteria problem. That's a big word, heuristic. But it basically means you don't have all the equations, you don't have all the information, but you still have an optimal methodology to approximate a solution. And I think over a long period of time, SNOP can provide that approximate solution that converges the organization to behave better. And we like to look at this picture to help us. We use the, we look at the Wallace and Stahl method. That seems to be the book we see and process that a lot of people follow. Uh, I mean, it's basically a five-step sales and operations planning and starts with data gathering, demand planning, supply planning, there's a, a, a pre-meeting to the executive meeting, and then the executive meeting in which all of, you know, the KPRs are reported and major decisions that are, require executive uh, input are handled. Since SNOP has become popular, um, a lot of the ERP systems, and I think we look at SAP and Oracle perhaps taking the lead there, have enhanced their product offering with functionalities that support SNOP. The demand planning, the capacity planning, the materials planning, inventory planning can all be coordinated within the SNOP structure and aid the team that is managing and coordinating SNOP to be more effective and more efficient. So we have to acknowledge the value of the ERP systems. And you can see that in the center of all this, we have our demand caster product, which also can turbocharge the effectiveness of some of these other systems. I would say that as, as a general industry, we're in a good time and place for SNOP. We have solid, proven SNOP processes. We have excellent and very sophisticated ERP systems and other software tools like our demand caster product to facilitate and process, facilitate the process of SNOP and to help us manage the data. We have knowledgeable experts, such as many of you that are listening, implementing and overseeing the process. It's not a question mark. That's actually a statement. I have great faith in everyone that's listening, especially people like Raul and Mike that I know are off line. Why then are there countless seminars, articles, books, training sessions, and webinars on SNOP? I mean, every time you turn around, there's a conference on it, and it's talking about getting the most out of your SNOP, improving your SNOP process, relaunching, revitalizing your SNOP process. Well, the way we look at it is it's a lot like the implementation of ERP systems. We were promised one thing, and usually the one thing that we were promised was something quite spectacular, and we ended up with something much less. Uh, we've all experienced maybe the first time we implemented an ERP system or the first time we implemented an SNOP process. We were promised the world. This is going to make your life better. Your children will get better grades. Uh, hair will grow in my bald head. Uh, everyone will lose weight in the process. Plus, we'll get excellent business results out of this. And we don't always get that ROI. And I use the word ROI on purpose. Because you have invested in an ERP, you have invested in an SNOP process. You've put a lot of money, time, and man hours into implementing an SNOP. And if you're not getting the results that you want, something has to be done about it. So we focus on the process. We focus on the software. We focus on perhaps the data. That's not enough. 
I think what we want to look at, we want to talk about why successful SNOP can be so elusive despite the rock solid processes and systems, assuming that you've already improved the ROI on your ERP system. How leadership's demonstrated commitment level can make or break an SNOP and how broad cross-functional support impacts planning. How practitioners can improve the way they engage leadership and build consensus to support a successful SNOP. So we want to talk about the people part of sales and operations planning. So let's talk about this in the context of what we call a socio-technical process. And, and when we talk about it, we say sales and operations planning is the ultimate socio-technical process. So what do we mean socio-technical process? Are, are we talking about socio-technical systems? Either way, what does this concept mean? Well, first a little vocabulary. Process is a series of activities that happen in a coordinated or quasi-coordinated way. And I use the word quasi-coordinated because sometimes that's what SNOP feels like when we first start. To achieve a specific task or transaction or execute a transaction. System and processes are often used interchangeably. Before it was an IT term, systems engineering didn't mean IT engineering, it meant general process engineering, large-scale process engineering. That's the basis of where socio-technical systems come from. Here when we talk about systems though, and certainly in the modern era, when we say systems we mean IT or computer systems and often we are referring to ERP systems. So since systems means IT, we prefer to call the socio-technical system, a socio-technical process of processes. Based in the same roots as total quality, all work should be viewed as a process. Only then can you apply the principles of lean or Six Sigma or continuous improvement and total quality, which by the way, all overlap dramatically. And you want to move the process from that quasi-coordinated set of activities to a very coordinated set of activities and then you can optimize. And that's the path that you really want to follow with SNOP. When you start off, people aren't sure about it, they're not sure where to go, and over time, and I have to emphasize over time, you see me do that throughout the, the presentation, it takes a long time to make it optimized. The socio-technical system started in 1950s in the coal mining industry, believe it or not, I think it was in the UK, and they looked at this idea of socio-technical design because the coal mining productivity decreased, and it decreased primarily because the machinery designed to increase productivity was put in place, and it actually decreased productivity. Now, you know, if you think about how that could possibly happen, well, think about when you implement an ERP, for example, and you don't really trust the system, so you still do all the work the way you used to do it, perhaps on a spreadsheet outside the system. I recall, and I don't know if the rest of you are old enough to recall this, when we first got automated, automatic dishwashers in our houses. My own mother used to basically wash all the dishes before she put them in the dishwasher. So we have implemented a technical part of the system or the process to make her life better or easier, but she still essentially washed. She just didn't dry the dishes before she put them in the dishwasher. So it took longer. Productivity actually went down because the dishes weren't available until she finished washing them and putting them in the dishwasher. The dishwasher washed them again and dried them, so it took longer. This is the same principle that we're talking about here. So people have to learn to operate as technology changes. <clears throat> and as processes change and how their role changes in that process. So it's a design and improvement methodology designed to integrate the social or people parts of the process with the machinery and systems parts of the process. This is why when we implement an ERP process or system, it does not work as well as we expect this. Why we don't get the promise on which the project was justified. 
It's the same principle in SNOP. We put SNOP in place. We don't get what we want out of it right away. In fact, there's a period of time where people are ready to chuck it because it's not working as promised. Uh, you need that stick to it to make it go. You need continuous improvement, and you need management uh, resilience in making sure that people know it's important. So social technical processes, processes and systems in this modern age have three components. It used to just be machines and people. Now I think we have to look at systems, machines, and people. And when we talk about systems, we're talking about ERP and other systems to coordinate our data. Uh, we use systems that are used to manage transactions in our businesses. That includes spreadsheets, and that even includes post-its that we place on our monitors to remind us of things. All right, maybe not the post-its. The machines are the things that you can usually go and kick and hurt your foot if you kick them too hard. That's the factory and warehouse equipment. It's transportation equipment. It's the electromechanical technology versus just the systems technology. And lastly, the people. I mean, I just watched uh, one of the Arnold Schwarzenegger um, Terminator movies over the over the weekend. The systems and machines have not taken over the world yet, so we need the human interface to coordinate and work effectively with the machines and the systems that we have in place right now. And this is the crust of what we want to talk about. If you look at kind of an evolution of socio-technical systems, I mean, you start off with hardware, and you go to software, you have the human computer interface, and this is pretty much um, and this is a decent article to look at if you want to look at a brief introduction to sociotech systems. Uh, so we have the reference there for you. But there's an evolution of, of where you want to get to so where everything's working properly. You want to get to the point where the process that's in the mind of the people is the same process that's programmed in ERP. The process that people believe SNOP is following is the same process as being outlined and actually executed within your organization. Let's talk about this idea which is critical to this presentation, the socio-technical gap. The factory layout is fixed, or the transaction process in the system is fixed. Whether it's Oracle, SNOP, even using Demandcaster, the process perhaps in the software is fixed. Yet, there is a gap because people in the process, executing the process, doing the transactions, may believe the process operates or should operate in a different way. Usually it's rooted in legacy behavior, the previous process or what they grew up operating under. We know that people don't often deal well with change in this regard. This difference or gap will lead to mediocre or bad performance. So you have the human and social system, you have the technical system, and you have this socio-technical gap between what the human system is looking at and what is actually programmed into the business process, which is combined a combination of machines and software. Again, this is from Whitworth. Our, our drawing is a little bit simpler. You have the process in the ERP, you have the SNOP process in the orange. In the green, you have the process that's in people's minds, and you have a gap. You have a difference. As soon as you have a difference, look at they're going in different directions. The people are going in this direction. The process is aimed in this direction. It's, of course, a graphic, but it does indicate that if you follow the path that's in your own mind or in the minds of the people, you will end up someplace different than where the designed process wants to take you. This is a huge problem in ERP implementation. It's a huge problem in SNOP. Sociotech practitioners work to close this gap. Not only sociotech practitioners, you can apply Six Sigma to it, you could apply whatever continuous improvement methodologies you use, 
but you've got the and one of the principles of continuous improvement at Six Sigma is you have all the people involved in the process in the solution. Why? Because first of all, they realize, ooh, the process is supposed to work this way. We've all been operating in our own minds maybe two or three different ways. That's not akin to that. No wonder it doesn't work. What's the root causes? What's the fixes we can put in place? Now, once we're done with the project, we have a game plan that we've all agreed to and all understand, all the people understand, so it's a people part, what to do going forward not to make the same mistakes before. And guess what? The process in the people's mind moves probably closer to the process that's that's published, be it an SNOP, or the process that's programmed, be it an ERP. So sales and operations planning, in a sense, is the ultimate socio-technical process. Let's look at it. You have this data gathering, demand planning, supply planning. You have the pre-executive meeting, executive meeting. And this, again, this is the stall and walls approach. Here, again, is the steps that we're looking at. And look at the number of spreadsheets they're looking at originally in their design. First pass spreadsheet, second pass, where you're looking at management forecast, capacity constraints, and conflict resolution, which is all kind of done outside the system. I think a lot of companies have done a good job of bringing this part within the fold of the ERP system. What is the social process? People. Everyone has their own idea of how the processes work, might work, should work, etc. They all believe they're right. And guess what? Our organizations are cluttered sometimes, or you don't need very many, but we have 300-pound gorillas that tend to be right by just the fact that they're 300-pound gorillas. There's no maybe data or basis behind it. When do we see that the most? Demand planning, forecasting. We're going to sell, we have product ABC. We're going to sell 100 of it this month. The 300-pound gorilla being the marketing sales VP or the COO or CEO comes in and says, no way. We're not going to sell 100. We're going to sell 300. I know it. Don't you agree? Who's going to disagree with the 300-pound gorilla who wants to get pounded on? When we do demand planning, we have all different functions, and they have a great history of getting along perfectly. We have sales in the supply chain, finance versus everyone. I hope there's not finance people on the call. Uh, but if you catch them by themselves, they might actually admit to this. Uh, marketing versus supply chain and sales. Customers versus suppliers. Oftentimes I've used the word versus. SNOP is designed to make all of these collaborate in a better way. But before you start SNOP, there has not been a lot of collaboration. There's been a lot of fighting. There's been a lot of bickering. There's been a lot of different numbers. You have this the finance budget forecast. You have the sales, sales plan, the marketing plan. And you have the supply chain forecast, which has always been, as we know, the most accurate. OK, that's a job, too. What's in the technical process? The ERP, or web of spreadsheets, we use to coordinate and enable SNOP. Data and data management, the base forecast, which we try to turn into a demand plan, and the rough cut capacity planning are kind of the technical process. Also involved in a technical process are the steps that you've decided to use, whether you use exactly Wallace install or you've created your own version of it. So data and data management. The ERP war is won and lost with data management in terms of lead times, capacities, run rates. You have a base forecast, which we turn into a demand plan. And we have the rough cut capacity plan, as we talked about. We're trying to coordinate all of this activity in a monthly operating cycle, coordinated with your sophisticated IT systems, be it ERP, legacy, whatever. So we have the socio-technical gap. And if you do not close the gap, a complex process like SNOP will basically unravel and die. People, why they might have some enthusiasm about it at the beginning, if you have these kinds of gaps, they will lose interest. They will not participate in the meetings. 
your process will unravel and die. I, want, I would be interested to hear those of you that have had that experience and what you have done the next time you relaunched it or revitalized it or launched it at another enterprise. Formal socio-technical designs was always used more in factories. It was very popular in the 1980s and 90s when we were creating new factories. And you'll remember because that's when factory workers went from being called uh, employees to associates. That was one of the big things that was a, if you're calling your factory workers associates, there's probably been some socio-technical design. And it involves a huge QFT-like matrix where basically you take all the functional tactical, technical activities, and you lay it against all of the different people in the different organizations, who has primary responsibility, who has support responsibility, and you're just trying to get an overview of who has to do what to whom to make the whole thing work well, and then you take that and you define for the primaries what their roles are and the support people what their roles are, and it's basically a huge process design. You can definitely do this in white collar, it's been tried a few times that I've seen. It's too cumbersome to work. I think it's better to get something up and running and then have a continuous improvement program to follow up with it. That would be uh, probably the better thing to do. So what we use, and much like our concept of supply chain physics, it's not a prescription. We use this idea of the socio-technical gap as a powerful tool to illustrate and motivate our clients when we talk to them about why their SNOP processes aren't working. And we use it to focus the continuous improvement activities around this to make SNOP more effective. So let's talk about improving this people part of the SNOP process. The people part is critical. It must be management-led and reviewed so that all functions come to the table prepared and willing to work together. That's the cornerstone of SNOP. If you don't have that, if the people aren't going to play well together or at least be open to playing well together and improve that over time, it's not going to work. If implemented between customers and suppliers, it will only work as well as the lower commitment level of the two parties involved. In other words, it's the same principle as supplier quality management. The quality you get from suppliers will, cannot be better than the quality systems you have in place in your own operation. Or they can't be better than the quality systems that the supplier has in their operations. It will be the minimum of those two things. The same thing with SNOP when you're collaborating with your suppliers. And good SNOP processes want to involve their customers and suppliers. Important, before you even involve the people, is make sure you have the prerequisites in place. The process steps are well defined, easily communicated. Ensure that the data in the system is clean and up to date. We'll talk about a little bit more about this. Be able to provide a good statistical base forecast. That's not your demand plan. It's a good statistical base forecast. If any of the above are wrong or unreliable, fix them before implementing SNOP. It will save you a lot of time and headaches. People are skeptics. So when they're going into something like SNOP or ENR, ERP system or implementing a new quality system, whatever it is, they're, they're skeptics. They think this darn thing doesn't work. It, it, it'll be a waste of my time. Bad data and bad base forecasts will cripple SNOP coming out of the starting gate. You don't have the basics, you don't have the foundation in place to do what you've got to do on a more sophisticated level. What will people do? They will revert to what they were used to, i.e. the legacy process using spreadsheets perhaps outside the systems, outside the SNOP process, and this darn thing doesn't work becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you've got to have those prerequisites in place. The other thing is, is a principle that we use when we do improving the ROI on ERPs. There's a lot of similarities here. Let the system do the heavy lifting. This is often ignored 
basic principle of ERP, ERPs. Use the exception management approach and the functionality of the system to address only the exceptions in the various SNOP steps. In other words, if their base forecast, base statistical forecast is showing that there's no issues with past performance and therefore you can believe no issues with future performance for a family of SKUs or specific SKUs, don't spend any more time planning. Go with the base statistical forecast. Use the meetings to talk about new products, promotions, those things that you don't have good enough history to be able to predict where the demand will end up. And so the, the, you need the collaboration of sales, marketing. You got to be able to communicate with finance. You need their collaboration as well. So th when you do this kind of ex exception management, if in your capacity planning, there's no issues in 80% of the business. You focus your meetings on the 20% where there are issues. This shortens the meetings. You can advise those people who need to attend based on the agenda. In other words, Larry, you don't have to come today because your area seems to be all okay. But the focus factory manager of product XYZ needs to be there because we're seeing some capacity issues in the next six months and we're going to have to do some production planning to pre-produce some of this and it's going to increase our inventory short term. So instead of Larry, Sue may attend the meeting and she needs to be there because we're going to specifically talk about her things. People appreciate this. They appreciate it a lot. So if they don't have to be sitting through a mind-numbing meeting listening to other people, it's SNOP meetings can be like a like a swim meet. I don't know if any of your children ever swam. Mine did. It's excruciating boredom followed by, you know, one minute of excitement when your kid's in one of the three events over a four-hour period. So if you only have to be there for what you have to be there for, people appreciate that. So if you can use this exception management, it's key to making SNOP work. An overly complicated and tedious SNOP process will not be sustainable. I mean, here's uh, you know why Neanderthal man became extinct. Yeah, I don't know. It seemed easier when we just went hunting. I know Og, but Og is, uh, I know, uh, but Og assures me this will improve efficiency and keeps the head of the Cro Magnons down in the valley. Planning and over cumbersome structure is not what you need here. You want to make it as simple as possible for pe people and this this little cartoon illustrates the point I made before about using exception management. There's a few SNOP myths. It's over at Go Live. That's the same myth actually that we have when we use ERP systems. It's, it's over at Go Live. Flip the switch. Life is better. The lights come on. Everybody's happy. And the second myth is it's a demand planning-led effort. Let's talk about these things. Now, it's not over at Go Live, as most of you know. It's just the beginning. You have to constantly be aware and work to close those socio-technical gaps. Find the gaps, close the gaps, find the gaps, close the gaps. That's why it takes a long time to stabilize an SNOP process, and it it's a continuous improvement effort that takes maybe two years to do in some cases. Go live is just the beginning. Not only of SNOP, but also it should be the beginning of the SNOP continuous improvement package, including KPIs. And you should have a couple KPIs operational, which is demand planning accuracy, inventory, and customer service. Because if you do SNOP right, your inventory should go in the right direction, i.e. lower, and your customer service should go in the right direction, i.e. it should improve. Your demand planning accuracy should be better. How much better remains to be seen, but it should be better. What are other KPIs? You should look at some participation KPIs. Attendance by function at the meetings, and there's nothing wrong with doing surveys, and maybe face-to-face -face surveys with people to say, what do you like, what don't you like, what is bothering you about this SNOP process? What can we do to make it better? Because if you don't do that, you lose them because of that mind-numbing boredom or the fact that they believe that it just doesn't work. It's a complex socio-technical process, SNOP is. 
it's replacing a process that needs improvement, but that everyone is used to operating within. When you take the current, you know, a pre-SNOP or even a current stumbling, bumbling SNOP process, people are kind of used to working in it. They know where their limits are. They know what they can do. They know what they can't do. They know who they can influence and bully. They know who's going to influence and bully them. And somehow, business goes on. SNOP, we have to realize, will not work as expected coming out of the gate. We have to know that. So you need this continuous improvement mechanism in place. You need the KPIs, and you need continuous improvement, be it Six Sigma or your own homegrown system or processes that you use, the five-step method, seven-step method, 8D, whatever it may be. You need to have something like that in place. And what should the areas of focus be? It should be on data, it should be on base forecast and demand plan, and it should be on KPI improvement right out of the beginning and any big socio-technical gaps that you find. Okay. Why are the CI, the continuous improvement mindset and approach needed? Well, we're changing from a well-entrenched silo-based legacy process to a monthly operating rhythm that requires the cooperation of sales, marketing, finance, general management in ways that these functions are not used to cooperating. Of course, they're going to say, we meet together, we do this, we do that, but it's oftentimes just a bunch of people sitting around the table and not focused as the SNOP process can and should be. The other thing is that you know that this is not something that happens quick. You're building a skill within the organization. You're building a new operating rhythm. It will take time. Six months, one year, two years are not unheard of. So it will take, you have to understand this is going to take time. People have to be patient, and there has to be a dogged commitment of hopefully everyone involved. Myth number two, it's a demand planning-led effort. Now, it must be a business-led project to succeed, and the executive team has to be at the head of it. Well, okay, this is a cliche, right? I mean, we're talking about senior management needs to lead everything, or it's not going to work. Nothing that is complicated, nothing that involves significant organization change and buy-in will work without executive team leadership. I don't care if it's quality. I don't care if it's a new product development process. I don't care if it's implementing an ERP, and certainly, this applies when we talk about SNOP. The executive team needs to know their role and the importance of their role. People see what they do, and people see what they don't do. As soon as people see the executive team not having the executive meeting, not following up on the actions, KPIs, and SNOP progress in general, SOP, SNOP will begin to die. It's that simple. And it's no matter what we, as the practitioners or as coordinators of the process do, it will begin to die because people will go their own way. Top executives often initiate the implementation of SNOP. Hey, this is good. I see it worked at my buddy's company. We're going to do it here. But they need to understand their role in making it stick, getting participation within their functions, and the amount of effort and time it will take to make SNOP. SNOP part of the culture. It's not instantaneous. It will take time. That's six months, one year, two year process. The people that sometimes do it the best at these presentations talk about they're on a five year, they've been doing it for five years, and they still have a way to go to improve. It's the job of the process coordinators to communicate this as clearly as we possibly can. Oftentimes, SNOP is successful when there's a dynamic manager or director who runs a program. He's organized, she's organized, always well prepared, knows the process steps very well, knows the ERP system in and out, can control and work with people as best as possible, harder working than everybody else, and therefore gets the respect of all the people. But when that happens, it's also successful because everyone knows that in that company where you got this dynamic person in place, the executive team wants this and will hold everyone accountable. 
You take that same dynamic SNOP manager and put him in another company where the management team is eh, wishy-washy about it. He will work hard. He will look good. He might make good relationships, but the process will fail because people won't come to the meetings, and he won't understand why. Because he thinks, or she thinks, in his previous company, it was his personality, drive, ambition, tenacity, intelligence made it happen eh, to a certain degree. So it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition to have that dynamic SNOP manager. Place the same person or organization, like I said, where, where it is known the executive team will not be accountable. This manager will dynamically hurt herself or himself running into the walls of the silos. So let's summarize here a little bit. SNOP is the ultimate socio-technical process. Do not begin if the system prerequisites are not in place. If your data management, if your data is not clean, if you can't develop a good base forecast, statistical base forecast, don't start. Get to the point where you let the, the, the system do the heavy lifting. You shouldn't be calculating everything on spreadsheets. If you have any kind of sophisticated ERP system, you should be able to use functionality within the system. And then use exception management to set the meeting agendas. Tommy, you don't have to attend today. You know, we're not going to cover your materials. You've already, you know, you're, everything is, is tied up in your area. Bill, you have to come. And you, so you, people know when they have to come. And you can even set the agendas. The best places I've seen it work is you have to be there. We're, we're doing st stage three meeting today. You need to be there between 9 and 9.30. And sometimes there's a little bit of leeway either way. But people appreciate that. The continuous improvement process has to begin at go live and that mindset. If you train, you're also training about continuous improvement. Senior management must be involved and lead by example. How much do they have to be involved? They don't have to be there every day. They have to pop into some of the sub meetings every once in a while. But people in the organizations know when senior management wants it and they know when they don't. That's where their leadership by example has to be. They have to really want that. They have to know what they do. All of this advice that I'm giving you today is at a higher level and has to be adapted to your company culture and style. It's not a prescription. It's a, a journey and a process and a path that you have to follow. So I hope that this helped you today, this 45-minute this uh, deep dive into or shallow dive depending on your point of view, into the people part of the SNOP process. I think, though, most of the time when it fails, that's where we have the trouble is in the people part of the process. So in summing up our, you know, the, about our company at the end, it's key resources, our differences, we have software and expertise. We can help your company improve in these kinds of areas because of our software and because of the experiences that we have. So if you need to contact me or our Serenian, you can do it through our website. You can follow us on Twitter. You can email us directly. There's a toll-free number that you can call. Um, if you email me, I, my response will have my cell phone number on it and ours as well. So we're happy to talk to you, whether it's a 30-minute phone assessment or even to talk further about uh, the, the topics that we had in today's webinar.